Shabanovich. I'm from Indiana University, and I'm here to tell you about, with my colleagues, about robots for diverse users. In our case, it's children and older adults. Oh, and I don't have my clicker, which seems to be a theme today. So let me get the clicker. <laughs> So I'm going to be speaking today with two of my colleagues and collaborators, Dr. David Crandall, also at IU, and Randy Gomez from Honda Research Institute. And we'll be telling you about research we've done with two robots, Haru and Iris. But before we start talking about the projects, I want to throw out kind of a little provocation. Um, so Bill Gates in 2007 suggested that by 2020, we're going to have robots in every home. And this theme of having robots in every home is widespread in both our community, in the media, in expectations people have of robots. But as a person who works with users on a daily basis, one of the things that I often hear is robots are cool. We love to hear about them, but they're not for us. Um, and so there's kind of a divide between the vision um, and what users are saying is their experience with robotics. And so one of the things that I always wonder about is why is that? Where does it come from? And I think through our research, or my research of like more than a decade, I don't want to count anymore, um, one thing I've realized is one issue is that visions of robots assume certain kinds of users, often upper middle class or middle class at least, in particular contexts. Um, we do many of our studies in U.S. and Japan. There are other studies in Europe, um, but less studies in other areas of the world. Um, our, for example, our older adult users have told us that they don't enjoy the stereotypes that robots designed for them incorporate, such as that aging is a disability. The costs and benefits of robots are not necessarily even distributed. Um, and when we focus on robots, Users are sometimes also worried that we actually obscure social issues important to them, such as how do we get health care? So how do we get beyond this gap? One of the things that we've been trying to do is uh, follow participatory design principles and work more closely with users to fit robots with their values and practices. What does this allow us to do? Um, from the beginning of design, for example, we're able to start negotiating meanings and uses of technology with our potential users. We have opportunities for mutual learning where users can learn about robots and give us more useful feedback, and we can learn about users in their real lives and figure out how robotic technology might best fit in there. Um, one thing we also found, which is kind of part of what this video is showing, um, this is from a co-design study with, we did with older adults with dementia, is that users can get immediate and direct benefits from participating in the design of robots they actually feel a sense of purpose being listened to, a sense of well-being from being part of this kind of activity. And through this work, we can also develop social practices that allow the robots to be useful in users' everyday environment. Another kind of activity that we do as researchers is actually put robots directly in the places where our users live and we experience robots together with the users. So we, for example, put robots in, um, in elder care spaces or in schools, and we look at how they adopt and appropriate robots. We look at how individuals interpret the roles and meaning of the robots. We look at how different organizational factors, such as cost, which often doesn't come into the mind of researchers, or the labor that's necessary to actually make the robots work and maintain them once they're in the space, how do those things factor into whether people actually really decide to use the robots after the research is over. Um, and here, I'm going to just give you a little short video of one of the studies we've done with Haru, where we were kind of inspired by different activities that older adults and children do together in a daycare um, for both older adults and children. Um, and here they're doing Haru is kind of mediating activities like storytelling, playtime, singing, and trying to get them to not pay attention to the robot, but really to pay attention to each other and engage with each other more usefully. So the thing that I want to leave you with as a thought um, is that I think we should do more to create robots with, not just for, our communities. 
We can think of robots as more than just autonomous technologies. People always need to be engaged in and with robots to make them work. Um, we can focus on the way robots fit into existing workflows and cultures. We can incorporate how groups of people and organizations work with technology into the design. And my hope is that this allows us to develop to develop a kind of virtuous circle um, where people actually think that robots are worth the effort of using and worth the effort of helping us to design them and helping us to deploy them. So with that, I'm going to leave the stage to my colleague, Dr. David Crandall. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you, Selma. And so I'd like to talk about one of the two robots that Selma talked about. It's called IRIS, the Interactive Robot for Ikigai Support. This is a collaboration between Indiana University and the Toyota Research Institute. So in Japan, there's this concept of ikigai, that is your sense of meaning and purpose in life. And as we all get older, as we go through our lives, our our sources of, of meaning and purpose in life change, especially as we get older and we have changes in physical abilities, cognitive abilities, health, and so on. And so our vision for IRIS is that it is a social robot that lives in the home or community center of older adults and helps them reflect on their sources of meaning in life present, past, and future by engaging them in sort of natural conversations. Based on these conversations, the IRIS can uh, give them recommendations about how to enhance or maintain their sources of ikigai, things like maybe contacting their family, maybe reminding them of the things that they enjoy doing, maybe uh, recommending participation uh, opportunities in the community and uh, society at large. And as Selma mentioned, when we're designing for a community like this, it's very important that it's designed in a user-centered way. And so we do this by having surveys, interviews, co-design workshops, and user evaluations in the homes uh, and elder care facilities for older adults, especially older adults with, uh, who are living with dementia. And so instead of telling you more about this, let me show you an example of an interaction with Iris and uh, some of our older adults in Indiana. The photo closer to my face. <laughs> <laughs> this is my nephew and his wife and their two children. They are very important to us because they represent part of who we are and, uh, and who I have become. We saw within about 12 or 15 feet of us a 12 foot tall grizzly bear it must be cute. <laughs> what did you see? It was so cute and cuddly, we wanted to pet it. And cousin. <laughs> Don't think I understand that one. <laughs> So you can see the fact that Iris is embodied in this cute little robot helps to the older adults to get engaged with it. Even when it messes up, it sort of provides this opportunity to, to have fun. Um, now, we're doing these kind of studies in both the US and in Japan because we want a, a Iris to be useful in different cultures. Um, and so let me show you an example here of Iris uh, with an older adult in Japan. So even though we're having we're taking this user-centered approach to designing Iris. Um, there's a ton of sort of technical challenges underneath the hood that have to be solved. Um, just simple things like trying to have a natural conversation with someone, especially an older adult, especially an older adult with dementia. There's sort of very simple problems that are actually very difficult, like figuring out when it's the time for Iris to respond, when, when the older adult has finished speaking. Um, and to do that, we, can, we rely on both what the person is saying, but also we're trying to use the tone of voice, some of the gestures, facial expressions, and so on. We also want to identify when people are talking about something that's meaningful to them through those kinds of features. 
We're using large language models like ChatGPT to power some of the interactions, but, but doing that in and of itself is quite challenging because we don't have a lot of control over what those large language models do. And so uh, establishing the appropriate guardrails so that the interactions are positive is important. And finally, we're trying to develop ikigai, uh, ikigai models that would be personalized to a particular person so that Iris could learn over time what is important to someone and then provide recommendations for how to enhance and support the ikigai. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our uh, amazing collaborators, uh, our students and postdocs at Indiana University, uh, researchers at Toyota Research Institute, and the participants in our study who are, of course, essential to making this work, and the many institutional partners. And now I'll turn the mic over to Renny. So I'm, I'm Randy. Um, at the Honda Research Institute, um, we envision a society in which intelligence systems play an important role in nurturing good relations among diverse members in the community. Um, during our activities with um, UNICEF, we built uh, the project called Embodied AI for Cross-Cultural Mediation. So in this project, um, we built a platform in which um, children actually has the um, potential to interact with um, their remote peers. And we introduce a robot to facilitate that interaction. And the idea is that perhaps the robot could actually encourage children to share and to open up and bridge the gap caused by cultural diversity. Um, in this project, we adopted um, UNICEF's policy guidance on AI. And as we developed the system, we tried to um, design in such a way we develop something that is more responsible and more beneficial for children. And we did several pilot testing in order for us to develop something that actually children really need. So, I would like to show a very short video that explains the narrative of the project and the overall trajectory of the kind of project we are interested in at HRI. Over the next five years, HRI is focusing on research in AI that is designed to proactively nurture positive relationships and social cohesion. Our first phase is aimed at supporting inclusive practices and an acceptance of diversity through an embodied AI that acts as an encouraging mediator. Children and the adults they become are the future of a diverse and cohesive society. At HRI, we're working with various partners and stakeholders to design an encouraging mediator that aims to support appropriate pro-social skills and ways of thinking that bridge cultural differences and support equity, diversity and inclusion through an exchange of ideas, discussion and shared experience with their peers in other countries. The Encouraging Mediator will adopt UNICEF's policy guidance on AI for children as an interactive cross-cultural shared experience that creates an enabling environment for its participants. Diversity is about what makes groups different from one another. Community is created out of sharedness and not by sameness. Our Encouraging Mediator, equipped with human understanding, autonomous behaviour generation and creative learning modules, will facilitate and mediate interaction and communication with children from various institutions from all over the world to form a diverse and shared community through a series of activities that encourage self-expression, open discussion and an understanding of each other's cultures. So currently we are um, in discussion with different high schools. Um, we are actually piloting the system. We're trying to look at the impact of our system to children's development. And we are also in discussion with educators in um, developing contents that are actually beneficial to children. Um, our target in the next couple of years um, we should be able to deploy our system to various schools um, in different places in the world and hopefully we should be able to embed our system to the um, 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 educational system in which children would benefit. Thank you very much. <laughs> 